Chapter 17 Showtime When Platt returned to the U.S., he met with Mike Rochford. In Moscow, Platt recounted, he had met four or five former KGB types, but one in particular, Alexander Sherbakov, he thought might interest Rochford. The ex-KGB man was eager to come to the U.S. and find a business opportunity. Platt also relayed his clear impression that Sherbakov was hungry for money. Rochford was pleased to hear the news. Whether or not it might lead anywhere, another KGB man was almost within reach. For Rochford, it was as though a fly had unexpectedly flown into his spiderweb. But a lot of preparations would have to be made. First and foremost, Rochford would have to come up with a plausible businessman who knew the art world well and could talk convincingly about Russian artifacts. He would also have to be a good actor and willing to pose as a potential buyer of Sherbakov's wares. It was a tall order, but Rochford found the perfect businessman. An FBI special agent was a friend of William G. Stout, a member of the curatorial staff and registrar at the prestigious Frick Collection in New York. By great good luck, as it happened, Stout had previously worked for the FBI for more than ten years. With his FBI career long since past, Stout, according to Platt, was somewhat reluctant at first to take on his unusual acting role. But Platt had charmed and recruited a lot of agents in his career. I spent two days with him in New York, Platt said, and he agreed. Stout also got a green light from the FBI's New York field office. Stout was more than qualified for what the FBI asked him to do. He had an unusual background, combining the arts with law enforcement. He had earned a bachelor's degree in international relations, Asian studies, and classical history at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. After college, he joined the FBI in 1974. I was a language specialist and supervisor, he said. While at the FBI, he was sent to the Defense Language Institute and earned another degree in Eastern European languages, Czech and Slovak. He left the FBI a decade later to go to graduate school at the Fashion Institute of Technology, where he received a master's degree in museum studies and decorative arts. After that, I worked at the Getty as a fellow, and then to Frick. As registrar at the Frick, he had a broad range of responsibilities, from working with the curators to supervising the care of exhibits. His adventure began when his FBI friend called him. He said they were looking for someone from the New York art world to contact a Russian who wanted to sell art objects in America. For Stout, the unexpected request from his friend was the beginning of a roller coaster ride in New York and Virginia with mysterious intelligence operatives who revealed very little about themselves. Very quickly, my FBI agent friend and I were flown to Washington. We were picked up at the airport and driven somewhere. They never said where it was. Maybe Langley, CIA headquarters. They went over what they were looking for me to do. They were not offering last names, a lot of first names, Stout said. They called me Bill. But Stout had worked on some espionage cases at the FBI and knew better than to ask a lot of questions. They sent out for pizza. I spent the night at a hotel somewhere in Virginia. The next day, I was taken to the FBI field office at Buzzards Point in Washington. I wasn't aware of the importance of the case until I was there and was introduced to a higher level of agents. They briefed me on the procedure. My first action was to write a letter to this man in Russia. I was acting as a go between the Russian and my clients in New York, who I said were interested in Russian artifacts. If he could find the time, I would fly him over, give him a per diem, and discuss what he had to offer, and what I had to offer. I asked him to bring a sample. Stout wrote the letter on his personal letterhead with his New York home address. He was careful not to use the Frick's letterhead, but identified himself as the registrar at the Frick. 
In Moscow, Sherbakov was elated to receive Stout's letter. His pleas to Platt had produced the invitation he so badly wanted. He entreated Vasilyenko to help him obtain a new passport, since his own had expired. Vasilyenko assisted him with the passport and other documents he would need. When the paperwork was complete, Sherbakov wrote back to Stout, accepting the invitation. I received a reply from the Russian and made a reservation for him at the Benjamin in Manhattan, Stout said. The Benjamin, at 125 East 50th Street, describes itself as a luxury boutique hotel. I wrote again, Stout recalled, saying his plane ticket was waiting for him in Moscow at the airline's office. In late June of 2000, Sherbakov arrived in New York. Stout was waiting for him in the lobby of the Benjamin. He described his visitor in words that evoked his FBI training. I'm six foot one, and he was shorter than me, maybe 5'10", 185 pounds, brown hair. He wore a suit. He was pleasant looking, with a friendly face, no facial hair. He was personable. He knew his way around people. I was expecting a professional, and he fit the role. He wasn't flashy. As Sherbakov went upstairs to get settled, Stout walked outside to wait in a parked car with FBI agents. He was back in the lobby when the Russian reappeared. He came back down with a shopping bag, and we sat in the lobby in two armchairs. We exchanged cards. Mine said, William G. Stout, decorative arts specialist. From the bag, Sherbakov removed and carefully unwrapped several Pollock objects. A lot of faux Pollock pieces are sold in Russia, and Stout was taking no chances. I made him unpack them to be sure. The pieces were real. He had a plate about eight inches high with a hand-painted floral design. He also had an egg with a portrait of Christ. The egg was seven or eight inches tall with flowers on the reverse side. He also brought out three small boxes, all had narrative images from Russian folk stories and fairy tales. He said this was a sample of what he could sell. He asked me what would sell well in New York. He said he would ship items in the future. I told him if what he brought was a good indication, I thought we could do business successfully. I said I would talk to my clients, show them the samples, and we would talk again while he was still in New York. He completely believed me. I gave him two envelopes. One was his per diem, and the other was payment for the Pollock, about $1,000, I think. We were going to see each other every day. I said goodbye to the Russian, took the shopping bag, and walked out to the parked car. I was taken back to the FBI office in the federal building near City Hall. They went over everything that had happened in minute detail. I left the Pollock pieces with them. I was thanked and given a ride back to my apartment. I never saw the Russian again. As far as Sherbakov could tell, the man from the Frick had vanished into thin air when he walked out of the hotel lobby. I was called back to the New York field office about two weeks later. They thanked me, and that was it. Everybody was very happy. I played my role successfully. Stout had done exactly what the FBI had asked him to do, and did it well. He returned to his job at the Frick Collection and kept secret his brief off-Broadway acting career. The FBI, apparently adhering to a need-to-know policy, never revealed to Bill Stout what a crucial role he had played. He was never told that he had helped to crack one of the most important espionage cases in the entire history of American intelligence.